Good morning, everyone. Uh, how are we doing? We've got a nice uh, few heads in the chat already. Here we are once again with what is going to be episode number 47 of M Product. Myself, Stish, and of course, as always, to my right, if you're watching, uh, Quinny, my sparring partner. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Buzzing for the... I'll just turn my phone on a second. I'm sorry. But yeah, buzzing for the weekend. Buzzing for the... To see the back of the internationals, as it were. I almost got lucky with internationals, but Stish Scotland, we had some great results and uh, yeah. I had some important cards, but I just didn't have enough of it, you know, so I never came out the international break with any end product, as it were. A couple of so coins, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, but nothing else other than that. So, yeah, buzzing, mate. Looking forward to the weekend. What about you? I... Similarly, I mean, I had a few cards playing, but I couldn't really get a really strong lineup out. So I've, I, I do have one still in with a shout. Um, I've got a player playing right now in the Japanese fixture. Well, it's about to kick off 20 minutes from now while we're recording. Um, but Takamine is playing um, for uh, Reiso against Urawa. And if he can hit another, if he can hit a decisive, I might find myself in for a tier five. I can see. Um, I'm 33 points off a of tier five uh, and and 0.02 ETH, uh, 24.3 points off a tier five card. So if he can hit a decisive and have a good game, who knows? But I think his average is normally about 55. So if he hits that, it might not be enough to put me in the cards. But still, still an outside chance of uh, of something if 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 he has a a worldy of a game. But um, but yeah. Urawa versus uh, Reiso, then I'm, I fancy Urawa to win that. So I don't have high hopes. But yeah, it wasn't no no real end product. But uh, still, it's still there with an outside chance. Been putting my teams together for the weekend. Uh, I don't know about you, but in, coming back off internationals is always a bit of a minefield, isn't it? I, I've been uh, really struggling, as I usually do. International breaks and Champions League midweeks always mess up my. Uh, thought process a little bit How, how's your team building going well yeah I, I am you know in these situations i do try and prioritize guys that have not played midweek or not went away on international duty if you can but the fixture list for my cards isn't that great this weekend you know so i have to really watch what battles i'm picking and with um the change to the uh, the threshold at super rare level, and obviously all the changes we've had anyway over the last. I think we're all still discover. We're, you know, we're all still in this discovery phase of the cat modes, and really, what strategy can we implement? What strategy do we want to implement? What scarcity do we want to play with? We're still all kind of trying to figure that out, and then when that happens, on top of it as well, it's just been another uh, factor, another you know, just another set of numbers to add into all the equations of. What what is the optimal strategy for me this week? What division should I go for? And yeah, so it's tumultuous to say the least at the moment for me. I almost forgot about that update. For anyone that's listening that doesn't know what we're on about, uh, the the big sort of arrange announcement of last week since the last episode was the new thresholds for unique and super rare level, which um you know probably won't affect everyone that listens to this podcast. But I think like me and Quinny. What probably both be in agreement that it would it's all about that end product yeah exactly <laughs> i mean if if thresholds has never really been something i think since the new thresholds came in um or like the new sort of cap modes and that i, I don't know about you but i've never really like I, I i've kind of like targeted it a lot less than i thought i would i think going into it i looked at it, it was like when the announcements came for the initial thresholds and, and again with the recent super rare one i think the main reason this weekend i have um gone in with like my best lineup into cap 240 super rare because as we spoke last week my goalkeeper options are a little bit limited so i've only really got one goalkeeper super rare that's likely to start this weekend or or is a safe bet as a star at least so i've gone in in there with that goalkeeper that's my main entry for the super air divisions but that wasn't more because of the announcement it was pure like what else can i do at the moment 240 or 270 is probably like my best bet um or all-star of course because i've got the unique but um yeah a lot a lot of injuries i think my japanese uh sort of bargain goalkeeper has even been got a really bad ankle injury last weekend apparently he's going to be out for six to eight weeks and it's likely now he'll kind of lose that first place because he was lucky to be in there anyway. 
by all accounts. So that might be the end of the utility I got out of him. But he, I managed to like win him at auction for about fifty quid. So it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's, he he he's done his job. He's uh, I think he's you know he's won a couple of rewards. But um, yeah, I don't know about you. Uh, have the new thresholds for super rare made you think about that cap two forty? Trying to get that um, the new threshold in the 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 it's a better it's a better amount to win, isn't it? It is quite a nice when you look at it. What, what was what was the announcement actually? Is it is it two hundred dollars a super and five hundred dollars at unique? There you go, two hundred dollars. So like my thinking on it was, if you win a sort of like a lower end super rare, you might struggle to sell it for two hundred quid. Do you know what I mean? Two hundred dollars. Yeah. So it's not actually a bad shout to. Target that. Try and get the two hundred, and if you're lucky, you might even scrape a card as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it hasn't. It excited me as anything else in any any new sort of news on that front. You know, an improvement on what you can win cash wise is obviously good news. But it hasn't really impacted me. I still think that like the top end of the card rewards is is where you want to aim, isn't it? I, I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. Yeah, well, I'm always after the maximum net gain out of my teams, if you know what I mean. So, like, it has been until recently. Like, I think, like, that. <clears throat> so, totally um, in terms of what, what you're saying, they're just trying to work out, like, yeah, what is the thing to go for? Is it the top-end cards? Is that the thing to aim your gallery towards? Or is it, like, again, like, you, you know, in different divisions, with different strategies, when you're at different maturity points, like, you know you're not ready to you know you know your team's not top 20 capable it's not top 50 capable so you know like in those game weeks like oh let's let's try and get a tier three in or let's try and get a tier two new tiers i'm saying yeah um, not, the, not the old ones you've never crossed your fingers for tier threes but <laughs> uh but nowadays you might um sort of thing so it's, it's a little bit of that but as well like i think like the 240 division now like if you are in that zone of like oh you're going to be aiming for a tier three or a tier two anyway in the camp 240 that is all you're doing because that's all that's there. And no matter where you finish, as long as you've got a good stab at it, you know, the wallet will increase, you know. So I think the I think as soon as it came out, I can't stress enough how much I think people are overlooking. And I've said I've tried to say it often enough, but like the fact that they're putting money into All Star and what we've seen with that in terms of like their ability to pay out cash is much more powerful than their ability to pay out cards. And again, we spoke about that last week or the week before where like, you know, money's scalable, you know, like if the user base a thousand X tomorrow, yeah. you know, that money scales with that, you know, they could pay a thousand X more places, for example, just on easy back of a um, fag packet, as they say, but <laughs> um, uh, maths. So it's, so I think that, I think that, uh, you know, when they did that, along with when they announced these thresholds, the terminology was like along the foundations, quite strong from Nicholas, especially like this will be a foundation part of the game, or this will be yeah. a, a strong pillar of our gameplay, or it was something to that effect, you know. Um, so again, it's great to see those amounts going up, but for me, it's just the added confidence of, you know, I think we're very much going along the same kind of roads of maybe what they've planned out. MLB, I think, has had an announcement or is getting an announcement that ETH is coming prize wise to that. Oh, really. I yeah, that. I don't know if I don't know if that's a rumor I've caught in a group chat or if that's a semi announcement or something or it's announced. But um, so like in terms of like the competition, like yeah, you. So for me, I'm looking at it session. I'm more thinking about I need to what. So the cards I need to get into my gallery, I've not got the wallet to go out and get, and yeah. it's like mid tier to low tier uniques because five hundred dollars a game week. If I could do that two or three times a month you know, eventually, then that's a, that's something for me to work towards. That's a, a progression for me to aim for, you know, and mm. I think um, if you're in the limited and the, the rare the rare modes, I don't think limited it will come anytime soon. I think limited already has way, uh, a very generous offering, to, to be honest with you, for how many cards are out there. I think, again, that will scale over time, but particularly if you're in that limited zone of looking at rares or if you're in that rare zone of, you know, you're weird kind of no man's land of not knowing what to do. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, I think it's very, and you always need to be careful when, when you say these things, particularly on content, right? But I think it's reasonable to now lay um, forecasts. I get you. So when you're forecasting your gallery and you're thinking, right, where do I want to be in a year with my gallery? Do I want to be competing at this division? What kind of cards do I want to have, etc.? When you're working out or trying to forecast in game yield, like, of course, the threshold 
will probably be forever changing, as they told us when it came out. And we can see the prize pot that's paid out in all-star, rare, and limited, super rare, and whatever, is down to top hundreds and top tens and whatever, top thousands. Um, you can then begin to work that out into your thinking. You know, like, yeah. if I got, you know, immaterial, you know, you'll never know how much it will be paid out, but ranking your squad and thinking, I could be a top 100 all-star squad, you know, two months, uh, two weeks out the month, five weeks out the season, something like that. You can then start to factor that into your your gameplay strategy and in terms of what cards you can actually go for and how much like you know like because before but before the market dip that we've had recently so many rares were out of so many people's price range yeah. and now i think even those mid to upper tier limited players have got such a wide array of rares within touching distance and if you were to really zoom out and be extra patient I don't think super rares are really that far away for a keen limited player, you know, like if you were, you know, so it, so I, I think um, it's, there, there's never been more avenues of opportunity, I think, open. And I don't think there's probably been more stable ground to make new strategies on so rare with, if that makes sense. And I'm normally quite a cautious person when I say these things. So um, not financial advice. And this is all my matter of a quinny opinion and nothing else. But yeah. yeah. No, I think you made yeah. some good points there. And someone in the chat actually said that they have made the full announcement on the MLB ETH. So that is a official announcement, which I think is huge, massive. And it has to happen in basketball now. It has to. That's that was my next point as well. I think, you know, maybe maybe it's because the season starts and thinking, get it in now. Maybe the basketball the basketball hats just come out as well. Quinny's <laughs> he's just switched it up. But yeah, if if it's happening in the MLB, we you can imagine that they're kind of like building out the uh, what the kind of financial outlay looks like to add that to NBA. And I mean, there's been a lot of noise from the community about when, when are they adding it? When are they adding it? And I, I was always under the impression that they were never going to for MLB or NBA. And maybe it was something to do with licensing issues, all kinds of stuff. Right. But for me, it really, from a brand perspective of so Ray, like across all, sports that they're involved in i think if they're adding cash rewards eth rewards into the all the prize pools that is massive in terms like you said like you made a really good point there about that being more scalable than giving away cards because if the cards are set at that amount every season and you get a million users and you've only got a thousand limiteds of every player then you can't give away like a million cards over the course of the season of each player can you so but you can give more money away as you're making more on the market, blah, blah, blah. Everything scales that way. But um, yeah, it's, 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 that's it's very exciting news. I missed that MLB announcement. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit sort of like clueless to what goes on in the MLB world. I'm not really interested in getting involved in that one. I, you know, I, I've got me, I've got me NBA team. I, I'll pop my head in and out of the results on that. Um, there's some good tools out there that help you kind of build those teams. Whereas, you know, I do watch a lot of football and, and I'm happy to follow a lot of football. So as much as there's a lot of teams that I have to mess about with, I, it doesn't feel as difficult in a, in a weird way as like the M NBA. I wouldn't know where to start if I didn't have all the tools on SoRare data and all these other ones. Found a good one this week actually called uh, SoRare NBA Jet. Don't know if you've ever seen that. Have you checked that no. out? Really? No, it's good. It, do you know what? It's for anyone listening that does similarly to me and i'm sure a lot of football users are the same right you just bought a bunch of nba just to bang a team out and have a bit of exposure to it right so yep. so rare data lineup build has been like really useful for me and a lot of people uh, that that like me i think came into his fire football and just added an nba team as a bit of fun but so rare nba jet is a third party app that works similarly to so rare data in that it helps you put your lineups together but it links to so rare so that once you've done your lineups, you literally just click one button and they all get sent. So you don't have to go in and like manually add the players. Ooh. And I'm like, seeing that and seeing it work. I mean, I, one thing, one question that pops into my head always when I like link my so rare account to any new third party website is the security. Like, is this secure? Can they access my cards? Can they send? So like, there is that site. Ooh. But if you get it right and this does work, you know, you can put like 24 training teams together like that and just send them. You don't have to like manually go in and still do the training like you have to do with the NBA at the nice. moment. So, uh, yeah, it took me like two minutes to set my teams 
this week using that. I just went bang straight in, and I and I checked it against the so rare data just to see if like it's picking the teams differently somehow. But I think it uses the same metrics and same sort of like selection process as so rare data does for the lineup builder because it it selected the exact same lineup that so rare data did when I like generated a lineup. I see so, That was interesting. It made me did it did make me wonder like, are we going to see that from so rare data? For football, because most people that use Sora Data are probably in the lineup builder all week, like kind of like picking bits and bobs, you know, and and weeks ahead as well. Yeah. And the power to now, you know, like I think I've got like twenty odd teams lined up in my app. Um, it would be great to just cl- click go and like send them all to Sora in one click, rather than spending the twenty thirty minutes like going back and forth between the two tabs and adding my teams in. But that was a, that was an interesting. Uh, experience that i had this week in the so rare community sphere if you like that's that a good M- one nba jet yeah check it out i Appreciate think max and laird were talking on that office hours podcast saying that i think they're i think they're a couple of steps away from doing something similar so maybe that's a new access that so has given these third parties to now possibly yeah but i don't think they're too far away but i was going to say as well speaking of um all the stuff that we're chatting about john uh, on the so far so rare podcast this week had a lock and dan on and I was you, you you haven't caught the full thing yet. I was giving you some yeah. some headlines. One thing that I forgot that was a bit of a headline is it's like absolutely confirmed, but I don't think they were saying they were going to do it in any rush. I, I, who knows when it'll happen? Absolutely confirmed. Secondary market fees for football will be a thing. I think that's a good move, personally. Um, some people will get upset about it because you know it just means a little bit less money back when you're making sales. Um, you won't notice it so much when you're buying cards. I don't think it'll. Is yeah. not an issue, but if you're selling, um, it might it might annoy people a little bit. It I don't know if they announced it or not, but I think on the basketball side, is it like five percent or something like that? Uh, I feel like I that's quite high. Know, to be honest with you, I think it's five percent, which in my opinion is a bit too. Is it not? I think it scales with the purchase, does it not? Or am I? I can't uh, no, I think it's set. Like a set. I, I think, think that's the auto bid that scales with the, the amount. Oh, maybe yeah. Of. But the with yeah, like I don't know if they're set on it already, but I feel like five percent is a is a bit much. I think, especially with the amount of transactions they have on football, it's been you know the product's pretty mature. I I I'd rather see something closer to like two and a half to three percent. I think that's you know at some of the level that these cards are being sold at. You know, if you're selling them for an ETH or something, that's a lot of money that you're paying for literally like a transaction essentially. Um, and if you look at other sort of like NFT marketplaces like OpenSea and stuff, like sometimes the f- it's f- feeless, sometimes it's two and a half percent, whatever. And anything over two and a half percent feels a bit, a bit much to me personally. Um, but I do think like for the long term goal of, you know, and also it, you can see it two ways, right? What that, that what this announcement probably will mean is, firstly, it could create a bit of a selling frenzy where people are trying to get rid of their cards before they lose that percentage. But it but once it comes in, it should slow down the rate of selling because if you're going to like take a five percent hit every time you sell a card, you might be a little bit more thoughtful on like how you know how often how quick how quick you are to sell a card or yeah. you know selling. It might slow secondary sales down a little bit, but but yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I think uh, in terms of like prize pools and stuff like that, I wonder if the fees will carry through for. I don't think they do with MLB. I don't think they carry through if it's a direct offer, do they? I'm not sure actually. Um, I don't know enough to to really think. So I know obviously we're maybe talking about market listings. I don't know if there's a fee for if somebody sends you a direct offer. You turn and burn. I'm not sure, but see, I've not messed about with NBA that much. To I think it takes out. wake of any sale. So like whatever you sell, whether it's on the secondary or if it's on, well, obviously not on the auction market, but as soon as you sell to someone else, whether it's direct or if it's like you know they buy the listing, like five percent of whatever that sells for goes to so rare, and you get the rest. Uh, Kawax got a question in here asking about if it'll be including like card and ETH trades and all that stuff. No idea, mate. They just said that it will happen, but then later in the podcast they said. Any additional revenue streams are not in a rush to activate and market fees is a revenue stream. So there's like two dots in the podcast to connect if you listen to the whole thing for anyone catching this that hasn't caught that yet or maybe didn't connect those dots first time around. Those were two dots I connected, certainly. Um, 
definitely think that we were expecting it, though. I don't know about you, but I think they've said in the past when they launched NBA and MLB that those two would be kind of like the testing ground as well for like any new sort of models and ideas that they're sort of trying out. So as soon as we saw that going on in basketball, I think it was inevitable that if it went well, it would go into football. And I think I think it's sort it, it's a good thing long term for the game. I don't know about you, but if you know, it might it might be annoying to lose a little percentage of your sale, but it it will stabilize a lot of things. It brings a little bit more money, cash flow into so rare that isn't you know that. In, I think I'm assuming as well, like the way that their business model works is they make the auction, the player sells. Let's say it sells for ten ETH. Like obviously, not many cards sell for that sort of money, but imagine there's a ten ETH sale on like a PSG unique card or something like that, right? I reckon a large chunk of that goes to PSG. Then the rest of it goes into so rare. Um, you know, like it probably goes to PSG. Maybe the player gets a cut of it. I don't really know. But I don't think, you know, like the, I'm assuming that these sort of 5% fees that they take, they won't have to pay any of that back to the clubs. I don't know. But I'm assuming that that's how it works. Um, be interesting to see. If they, I'd love to know a little bit more about the the business model. I don't know if they if they're able to be as transparent about that. But. I'm I'm pretty sure I heard something a while ago, like a long while ago. Um, can't remember where, but it was somebody from within Soria, and they made me. They said something that made me think that in their licensing agreement they have secondary market fee royalties to pay to the clubs. Right. Um, which always like that it didn't no it didn't sit well with me, but it never made sense. It's like you don't you don't have any. Yeah, you know, uh, skin in the secondary market. So, you know, I didn't because uh, obviously with the whole thing with NFTs and you know this more as an artist, like one of the benefits is that royalty sale on, you yeah. know, if you create something. So um so I don't know if that was me. I see I don't know if I've remembered it wrong or whatever, but that is like something that's in the back of my head somewhere that that was said or intimated against. Yeah. I think um I mean if that is true, then they're literally at a loss, aren't they? Because every time someone trades mm-hmm. If they're not taking any money from it and they're paying some out to every sale, then they're going to start hemorrhaging money, aren't they? But um, there's someone in the chat, first time chat, and this is a controversial question, but I think let's answer it because sure. it's there. Uh, so Rare Legion, first time in the chat. Welcome to uh, the show. Hello, guys. Do you think the game is sort of a Ponzi scheme at the moment? I mean, I, I would... I'm going to go and say no straight away. I don't think any game that allows anyone to enter at any level, you know, anyone can come in now and spend more money than the last person and, and start winning. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a pon- That is not how a Ponzi scheme works. A Ponzi scheme, like the people who got in early are always, will always be the winners. And that's, I think like it might've looked that way to a lot of people that came in, you know, like, when the Gary V boom happened and it's like, oh, you know, you got in and bought a Felix for like 50 quid and now he's worth five grand or something like that. Therefore it looks like a Ponzi scheme to a lot of people, but it's like by definition, no, because anyone can come in and go above all of the people that started first. Now, you know, like is, is it, is it a pay to win or, or, you know, like that, that's more the question. Do you, is it, I don't think it is a pay to win, the cards are cost what they do because the player's output is what it is. And therefore the market decides that the value of those players is higher. But if you are an astute trader or you know football, you can get in, pick up a bunch of kids now who are like no one knows about. But if you know that this kid is going to be the next Harland and you pick 10 of them up and sit on it for five years, does that make you top of the Ponzi scheme in five years time when everyone looks at your collection is like, well, that's not fair. He's got like five Harlands and he paid 20 quid for him. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, they're saying... Uh, so uh, yeah. so if I can if I can come in on this. So I think what a lot of people miss when they... So I think what a lot of people miss when they look at this, right, is see the whole, so see the whole like Ponzi scheme and all that kind of stuff. What a lot of those things, like the genuine like, scams that are out there, what they are driven on is... Anyone in it's everyone and anyone involved. It's like the worst extreme of like multi level marketing, almost, you know, where it's like, um, you know, everyone is like a recruit to go out and recruit someone to go out and recruit someone to go out and recruit someone, if you know what I mean. But no one ever actually 
does anything. And you see these things on like, I can't even remember any real life examples to, to give you of something that's not football related, but you see them in like movies and TV shows all the time and some hapless soul ends up with boxes of stuff in their garage that they can't sell. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of vibe, you know, that's that, you know, so in that situation, what ends up happening is the money cycles to the top and it's some rich guy in a mansion somewhere and there's no real thing. There's no real company. There's no real anything. And it's been a vacuum mechanism of money yeah. up a pyramid cycle. That's what these things are, Ponzi schemes and all the rest of it. So they are, is not going to be that, but for the simple virtue of, you know, when they sell cards, like you said, the, the, it's officially licensed merchandise for a start. So it's not just so rare to sell the cards, it's the clubs that sell the cards as well. There's a game built around it. There's also all the other stuff that we can talk about, okay? But it's where uh, I think a lot of people miss the the, the connection or the, or the difference that, like, uh, so rare Legion goes on to say something like, because there's going to be new cards every year, like, you need new players to keep it going. It isn't, in that sense either, any different, again, to stickers, cards of any description because uh, yeah. i've got a seven-year-old who's mad for pokemon now right and i hate using pokemon as a story comparable but here we go and it's his birthday this week and you know i'm in the card shop with the, the wife the other day and all that. there's new cards coming out next week a whole new set of it's the same cards as last year it's still yeah. pikachus and charizards and all that but they're, they're in purple packets and they've got different yeah. pictures and whatever and that happens two three four times a year for all of these things now imagine Imagine who's it that makes Pokemon, what are they called again? It's not Bandai, is it Namco? Is it whoever it is, imagine they went bust. Is everyone holding a Pokemon card now the victim of a Ponzi scheme? Because yeah, it's just cards to play a game with and now they're bust. There's still a bunch of people out there that will buy them off you because they want them. And they'll off. be more sold next year and they'll be more sold next year and more sold next year, you know? And yeah. obviously the value of them is decreased and diminished so much because packets are £2 for 20 cards at random and all the rest of it. So their cards, you know, you're never... It, they're sold differently. So I, again, that's why I don't like it as a comparable because there's so many different things going on. But it's just the point of, you know, you can't, you know, because the fact that there's more cards coming out every year, it doesn't mean like, if you still got a first edition Charizard, it doesn't matter that there's 40,000 other versions of Charizard, if you get yeah. me, you know, so that supply element and what it does to pricing is just, you know, that is that happens to every game that gets popular. More people play it, more cards come out to play it. And um, again, another thing I would add into this as well is like, it's not just cards and even money that's on the line now. It is like PSV training sessions and it's meeting players and it's VIP yeah. ticket stuff and all the rest of it, where it's in sign shirts and all the rest of it, which will be coming into it. So like, I don't think any of the any of the economic factors that you would lean against so rare and say like, oh, that must mean it's this. Um, you could lean against any other company. And in the same industry, a similar industry, or even something that's not, and it's just, it's then just economics of business. If a business doesn't have customers, it doesn't have a business. That doesn't make every business a Ponzi scheme. That is just business. That's economics. That's capitalism. Yeah. You know, so that part of it isn't a sin, you know. Definitely. I think there's always a bit of a sort of a, an Ill, Ill feeling towards early adopters as well. I think like when I first got in the game, you do naturally have like, a jealousy towards the, the 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 users that are like constantly winning cards above you because you know naturally you want to be you want to win like they do but unfortunately you know you you don't you're not gonna you can't compete with those people who have literally like put house money on the line to get involved in this game and to win the way that they do every week you know so the only way that you can get there is either by putting in the money now and buying the same cards that they've got to compete with them, or you take a little bit more of a long, slow burn approach to it. And I think that was mine was like accepting I'm not going to win every week, but if I do invest correctly and I'm patient and, you know, don't buy it, don't buy at the top and sell at the bottom type thing, which I think like a lot of new players coming into the game, that are new to this naturally and were and this was me when I got into it was I'm looking at like how to win this weekend all the time like oh I haven't got anything I need to buy it blah blah you don't look at how to win this weekend look at how to win in six to twelve months time and try and forecast that and that's how you become a bit more competitive with the people who are winning constantly today without putting in the same money that they did if you can be patient and do do the research but obviously, another part of it is, you know, they, these people did get in early and did put their money in when 
they backed it when no one else was there. You know, like a lot of us came in when it was a bit more of a stable market game, whatever. Um, some earlier than others. I think I got I got in what was the end of twenty twenty one or something like that. So I've been on it over two years now, and some cards were still expensive. Don't get me wrong, but back then. I paid like 330 quid for a Verts and that was like, I was like sitting there thinking, I can't believe I'm spending this money on, on like a digital trading card. Like, this is stupid. I'm going to regret this. And you, you just know, don't you? Like when you, something feels like you're taking a risk. And I felt at that time, I'm taking a massive risk here. 300 quid on a trading card of a kid who like is bad, you know, he's just getting, finding his feet in the first team. 300 quid on a, you know, and I don't have the other pieces to put with a 300 quid card. My justification was if this goes well, he's more likely to like be say, sellable than like a lot of the sort of like J League players that I'd had up to that point. And, you know, like I think it's justifiable to me now, I think with my two years of experience that the people that got in before me and to many people getting in now, people like me who got in when I did, they, you know, justifiably, they're winning more because they've put a lot more on the line. And it's like, it's like a game. I think someone else is talking about poker and it's like you go to Vegas and you've got like the poker area and it's like you've got the area where it's like cash, cash table, like two dollars blinds, whatever, or, or like a sit and go like twenty five dollar entry winner takes all type thing. And then on the in the other part of the casino, you've got the five grand entry table or like five hundred and six hundred quid. And it's like, so rare is a bit like that now, where you've got your limiteds, you've got your caps, you've got your free to plays, you but you've also got unique division. And it's like, we shouldn't if if we're not playing in that unique division, it's hard to compare our experience to those that are on that table, and even to sort of like point fingers at and be like, oh, you know, it's not fair, they're winning loads, and it's like, well, they're winning loads because they're betting loads as well. It's not, they're not just winning loads because they got in early, like a lot of those accounts are still spending thousands on uniques and like all of that. So it's an awkward conversation, but it is, you know, sometimes you have to sit back and think, well, what, why do some of us think that we should be winning more without putting in more, you know? And I find there's a lot of that sentiment on, on Twitter, particularly uh, since, tw I don't know about you, Quinny, but since Twitter, Twitter kind of introduced that, for you section where it's like people you're not following all i see yeah. is like all the negative stuff from so rare oh, really? yeah i'm like it's just it just seems to be like all of those accounts that i don't follow that's just we get center actions but isn't it yeah yeah that's all it is is other people throwing their two cents against it and, and i see, know, I, know, I normally don't like to give this stuff auction because like let's yeah. be fucking real guys so there's like a four billion pound company or whatever at this yeah. point it's not a scheme it's not a rug you know a rug pool it's not anything sinister it doesn't mean it's you know, business is failing isn't always a nasty thing. It's not always people being underhanded or, you know, whatever. So if, you know, in five, ten years from now, something, you know, business is, is you know, let, let's be real. It's a real business at this point, you know. That's kind of where I'm at, you know. Yeah. But um, what I was going to say as well, like what you were talking about with the market dip, and there was a good question here from Parrot Press as well about the about a sliding scale almost for the market fee mm. uh, kind of things. If you look at uh, Pranksy's account, he went after the Mbappe Unique he has timed his entry into the market pretty sweetly. He's went and scooped up like 60 supers and like 10 yeah. U's, nothing else. In the last like couple of days, he's galleries like 100 plus E for something. And uh, the Mbappe unique auction went yesterday for 109 ETH dish. I had the over under on my Twitter is 75. So it absolutely spanked the over. Mm -hmm. um, so like, and that was Roxy that went and picked that up. So I don't know what that tells people about the market. A lot of people like to look at the big value uniques for something. Yeah. But again, like I was saying to Black on the Soria data streams, like you're never going to win that card. So I don't know really what it does to prize pools and knock-on effects, really. You know, it's just a marquee event. There's that, isn't it? And I think like in, in terms of utility for me, I think Mbappe still possibly the best card in terms of SO5 utility. Yeah, he loses his U23, but Mbappe is good for like, but barring any bad injury or something like that, that card is going to be putting up huge scores in any team he plays in for the rest of his career. Like the way he plays, um, you know, he gets the goals, he he dribbles a lot, he gets in and out. He's 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 a great forward card. He's got to be one of the best forward cards 
for the next 10 years plus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when he, even when he retires, if this becomes the sort of collectible hub, you know, if this is like the panini of NFTs in 10 years, that card is going to be like one of the cards that you wanted to have, you know? Um, yeah, it's uh, in, in, interesting. I, and I think like, for me, like that, that's a lot of ETH as well. That shows that like the whales are still after the cards that they're after. I think, um, I think some, I think it was YNWA on Twitter said that he expected Roxy to win that, that um, auction. He was like, he called that one. He said the only way anyone else is winning that. I'm pretty sure he was talking about Roxy. I'd have to go back and find it. But he said the only way anyone other than that account is going to win it is if their alarm doesn't go off because they're in like some other part of the world and it's going to be like two in the morning there or something like that. But I'm pretty sure he was talking about Roxy. I'd have to go back and find the tweet, but he called that if, if so. Um, probably knows he's been beaten by Mbappe and he's probably, Roxy's got Mbappe rage and he's like, I'm just going to go get him this time and make sure I get it. Could well be right, yeah. It's uh, yeah, an in, in, interesting question and another thing that is interesting about it, like you mentioned, was um, back to the sort of Ponzi scheme thing is like it gets people talking, doesn't it? And we're sat here now in on the live stream recording this and our chat is like on fire right now. There's so much coming through on the chat. A lot of people uh, talking about this and I think that that the sort of sentiment. How do you feel about the current sentiment? Maybe it's just Twitter feeding me some of the negative stuff, but a lot of it for me, there's like two, maybe two or three accounts that are just relentlessly negative on Twitter, and I I, I don't yeah. get it. What I'm not I'm not sure why. You know, like I think we've talked about it before on here that like my thinking behind it is like these are people that have sold up and are just so desperate to be right about the timing of their selling up that they have committed the rest of their life to like preying on the downfall of this product at the cost of all of the current users, which so obviously I hate seeing stuff like that. Cause I'm like, I don't need to see stuff like that. You know, if I felt like if I didn't feel comfortable where I'm sat with my gallery and like what I'm doing here, I'd be, I'd have sold up. You know what I mean? I don't, don't need to see that. I, it annoys me when I see that kind of sentiment from past users, you know, like, they're not really they're not offering much to the conversation, but I don't know how, how you feel about the current. I don't sentiment. really yeah, I don't I, I don't know. I don't I can all, yeah, I don't really have much of an opinion on like the, I, I don't know. I see the comments and all the rest of it and I, I think everyone's opinions is valid on everything, you know. It's always worth having a, a look and a listen and see what's going on and whatever. But I see I don't really pay it much mind beyond that stuff, to be honest with you, because like I think if you're that committed to something online like what you're talking about, or it could even be politically, or it could be any other number of things that people engage with online. Some people are just like, that's all I do on Twitter. As I go on Twitter and I hound MPs, or I go and do this, or I go and troll this, or I go on and talk about football news, or I go, you know, so I think sometimes it's just how people, you know, you have probably find that exact same person on Instagram is probably like a lovely account to follow, but you would never know it's the same person if you get me. But it's on Twitter, there may be an angry person or something, or who knows, man? But um, Simply Alex has got a great question I, I would want to pick up on. He's saying, would we want to see a market schedule for rare SR and use, like so you know when they're going to hit the market? It's quite I amazing. would love to see that, personally, but I don't think they're they're probably like two years away from being, I'd probably say two years away from something like that. I think for them to do something like that, they'd almost need like an AI attack algorithm that chooses as and when cards that are released because they I, I imagine they must have like a little bit of a chat about when to release some of the sort of like top tier uniques like there must be some kind of timing on yeah. that I mean, at this time of the season they must be looking at the cards that haven't been auctioned yet that you know like in a few months time won't have the utility that or, or you know like we'll in a few months time like end of may a lot of the european cards will probably like almost stop being released or auctioned because the new cards will be coming out in sort of like August, September time. So they'll be looking at a lot of those top tier uniques and SRs and thinking, you know, we need to use, we need to sell these, otherwise we can't mint them. You know, like how many cards even get their hundredth rare or their, you know, like their 10th super. There's a lot of big cards that that don't get the full hundred or 10 or thousand. And uh, yeah, but they, I guess like eight, the, the sort of rise in AI, you'd imagine something like that being deployed to like figure out when are the optimum times to release players based on like fixture lists between like Christmas and 
the end of the season, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think like you know, like Champions League um, potential, Champions League semi finalists, quarter finalists, finalists. That you almost like you want to keep make sure that you've still got those cards there when you know, like when the season gets down to like the kind of the real business end, and you've got like those midweeks where there's only like five games or something. You almost want to have players from those five teams available to auction because people need to buy them, right, from a business perspective. So with that in mind, I don't think it's possible for so rares like human, you know, they'd have to sit and look at the season. But like an AI, an algorithm could probably go, right, we we predict based on past, you know, and expectations and odds and XG and all that and bang all that together. And it goes, right, you want, you're going to need to, auction the Haaland super rare uh, this time and the save the unique for this week in the season. And then maybe if they like committed to that, then they could go, right, we forecast this is our kind of like unique calendar for the month of February. And it's like, get your ETH ready. Do you know what I mean? I like, don't know what you reckon about that, but that's kind of how, how I'd see something like that playing out. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Not too far off. Um Sorry, I'm just trying to keep up with the chat because there's lots of messages flying around. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think we're all in agreement that Twitter is not an overly positive place. Sorry, Stish, that was just uh, what was kind of catching my attention there. But um, yeah, yeah, and that's kind of all derailed me. Sorry, Stish, can you just throw that last one at me again? So I was just saying, yeah, I think like back to Alex. So rare, Alex. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot. I've got, I've, I've got you now. Uh, the, the reason I said two years, Stish, is because I think like you're totally right. It would need like, AI and all that kind of stuff, or it, that would certainly help. But the first one I think about that, I think, well, it's not going to happen this season coming because they've not got all their ducks in a row on a lot of different fronts. You know, like J and K are not back in town yet, blah, blah, blah. So it's probably going to, and then you've got the human element or an AI element to come into it. So, like, I think it would be nice. I think for the uniques, it would be very much worth their while. But see, one thing that I think is an opportunity in the unique market, in terms of the ones where, um, if you're lucky to pull a, 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 a tier four or a tier three from like kickoff or a cap or something like that, um, is who knows what a tier three unique is in the middle of the season versus the beginning of a season. Yeah, because like, how does a unique get valued? Is it on the SR auction? Is it on the rare auction? Also, the form will come into it, and a few other bits and bobs, you know. So, um, in terms of, so they'll definitely sell all their star uniques. They know that, and then the tier ones, I think they'll definitely sell all them. And then I don't think they reward any tier two uniques. So let's go and have a look at that. I think anyone really cares, but anyway, so uniques they probably could uh, schedule the elite ones. Maybe they're super rares. You could probably say the same. The ones that don't have much of a reward uh, distribution to contend with. But all the other ones, I think it's it would need like a master computer, especially for rares. Like, <laughs> there's so many cards, isn't there? Like you, yeah, it'd be almost impossible to forecast that. Not definitely for a human, anyway. But that was the thing that I wanted to bring up in line with the Mbappe unique as well. Um, is that I, I did the watch along for it on Surya Data. And auto bid is now on football, as you know, or max bid or whatever. And it was really interesting to watch. I don't know how it will quite play out with like limiteds and rares and stuff to this effect. Obviously, it's magnified because it's a unique and it's huge sums of money at play. But that Pranksy was winning, was like controlling the auction because he got on, I think, what was his max bid? I think it was like 90. I think right. he put on a max bid of 90 ETH. And it took like 10 minutes for Roxy, uh, Bellona and uh, JR Duke, maybe. It's like three of them came at it and were trying to get their max bid in, but that prank okay. was always triple O two of an ETH in front of them because the auto bid did kicked in, you know? And then, and then you know, his auto bid got broken, I think, at 90, and then it became a bit of a fight, and then it finished up yeah. at 109. But it was interesting to see that actually play out in, in real time, as it were, you know? So that was quite a fun one. So I didn't watch the live auction, but with that in mind, so did everyone sort of like like on the like final two minutes of the auction? Was there a back and forth then where like it, people were yeah, out with each other as well? So it still that, kicked in in the live mm -hmm. as well. Because that was what I wondered. I wondered if people just set their max bid and then it was like yeah, like the price was just decided about three hours before the auction ended, or it still no, went. Well, that yeah, that's what it, that's what it was. That prank it was always like triple O two of an Ethereum. So if Bologna was putting in 75 ETH, Pranksy would come up as 75 0002 instantly. Right. 
Yeah. You know, I've been using it myself on a couple, not nothing obviously as high end as a, as a, as an Mbappe unique, but uh, yeah, a few sort of like little super rare cheek, put in a cheeky beard on the off chance. It goes a bit less than the last one. But one thing I do think it will mean is a lot less cards selling for less than the last one sold for. Um, don't know what you reckon about that, but definitely feel Hard like to say. Because I think, like, if you're talking about sniping the super rare, like, if, I, if I'm going to snipe a super rare and I'm right excited for it, what I'll be doing now is I'll be going on first bid yeah, and putting my max on for the snipe. Right. And then, you know, like, if I've seen, like, if, I, if I'm going after a bigger card and then I see somebody else has beat me to that, like, Mark, you'll never walk alone or one of the whales, I'm always going to think straight away, well, they've max bid this probably to 5e for something. Yeah. Um. So I'm probably not going to get it and then you probably leave it alone. So... Maybe people will just get put off by, oh, somebody's already on this one. Because that Pranksy controlled the auction until his max was broken, you yeah. know? Yeah, I, I can't remember who I was bidding against, but I went on to a, I think it was a Super A the other day, and I put in like a max bid. And then as soon as I did it, it basically had been outbid. So I was like, oh, whoever, whoever, someone else has already obviously gone in and put in their max bid, which was higher than like my sort of like cheeky max bid on the hope of like get a little bargain overnight. But I think... Um, yeah, it it just means for me some of those late night auctions that finish at like three four in the morning, I won't have to set an alarm for. It'll just be like this is what I've got in the wallet. I hope I can win it for this. If I can't, then someone else will win it and just a bit more accepting. I think part of the strategy that will come in now, Stish, is like you know before, but it's been like when before this existed, like you would work out, or if you were really trying to snipe a card, you would work out like the multiples of every bid, what it would take to get you there. And then you look at the secondary market floor and then you look for that little sweet spot where you can beat the secondary market and if someone was to outbid you, they would spend more than they would on the floor. You know, there's yeah. a wee... So if you're still going to try and find that sweet spot, you're only going to get that by bidding first, you know, because you're on the auto, you know, you're on it for um, whatever. Yeah. So I think those... I think they'll, st I think they'll still be there. They might be harder and fewer and further between or whatever, but it, it will be, you know, first strike wins um for some of those pieces i think you know yeah i i agree i think uh i think it's good though i like i like the max bid thing i don't know about you but i think it's uh i kind of like it yeah no so far so good um i think there was a bit of discussion around it when it got introduced to basketball wasn't it and i think some people thought it was bad and then i'm in a group chat with two of my friends who who play the game and um, we I, I was quite positive about it. They were a bit more negative. And then over the course of the weekend, we all kind of came to the conclusion that it was actually pretty good, it seems, um, at least for the basketball market. We were quite happy. Um, you know, we, we're we not that active in the basketball market, though. You know, with the football, it's a bit more like, oh, I'm in there every day just seeing if there's anything of interest ending in the next sort of day or two. But um, definitely been a few. I did a, another thing I forgot, actually. I, I did pick up, my U23 Defender Super Rare, which last week we were talking about. Um, I was really lucky in a way, way. I had a few people message me saying, oh, I think I've got something that you might be interested in. So I had a few conversations with people. Um, and then I got in from, I was, I was, I can't remember what I was doing. I was out in the week and I got indoors and I got, um, I got my phone and a Jeremy Fringpong Super Rare was ending in like a minute and I was like, oh, quick, get online, get logged in, get quickly get in there. And it was like, I thought I've been putting bids in for uh, like 0.6 ETH on a few other cards and getting nowhere with them. And then Jeremy Frimpong was at like 0.35 or something in the bidding. And I was like, I anything below 0.6, I'm having it all day long. And I think I, I have to go back and check, but I, I won it for less than 0.6. And I thought, Jeremy five three three five stash. Yeah, love it. So I was I was well happy with that. I think he's a great card, good prospect. I, you know, he's one of those. The thing with fullbacks as well is that like the centre backs are guaranteed that a good AA, but a fullback is like their ceilings a lot higher. They can get the assists. Jeremy Fringpong almost plays like a winger sometimes. Like he plays. Jabby, like Jabby Alonso has played him right wing. Quite yeah, a few times, like actually on the wing, you know. Yeah, he. I've I've had a look at his like data on, and yeah, they've got him down as like right midfield, right wing on on some games, and it, he he reminds me a lot of when I had Masrawi at Ajax. It was almost like a winger, 
And Masrawi was an amazing scorer at Ajax. He was unreal. And um, yeah, I think an SR of a player who has that 90 to 100 in them could could be the difference for me, I think. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm using him in probably in my under 23 rare pro for the minute until like, I figure out this goalkeeper situation. But I think he'll be a really good option for D2 um, when I don't have like a unique there. or So, yeah, I was, I was, good looking, I was excited with that one. Often, like, the yeah. chat was wanting to know the update of your unique. Where, where is his fitness at, Lee Han Bomb? Uh, Lee Han Bomb, uh, apparently, so with the last I heard was quite a while back. Um, he hasn't. I haven't seen in any recent sort of training images. He was training all through pre-season. I think he picked up an injury like in one of the last friendlies. And the last I heard was that he was expected to be out till like early to mid April. So that's like around about now. So I'd, I'm, I'm just going to be keeping an eye on like FC Saws, like Insta. They're quite good at posting pictures from training and that. So nice. uh, I'll expect him back in training this month. So hopefully get to use him by the end of the month. Um, and I I would expect him to get back into the starting lineup. Um, but we'll see. But yeah, the Lee Hambom expected back in training this month. Uh looking forward to to that. I definitely need I definitely need him uh, back the close season. But like I said, the I need he's only gonna be of use to me if Tanny can like get a run of games because my uh, yeah, my my U twenty three goalkeeper situation is absolutely shocking at the minute. Even better would be if uh, Baek Jong Bom can like find his way into the number one at uh, FC Saul. And I think like Saul's uh, keeper has made a lot of big mistakes in the last couple of games. So if he's going to get a shout, it it might be soon. So I'm, fingers crossed uh, for for Saul making a change and getting the U twenty three goalkeeper in, but. It is what it is. I, I'm I'm looking forward to watching Lee Hambom again. I thought he was a good value last season. I think and we're all waiting to see the, the Korean Timber come back. Uh, yeah. Weasel Mount is saying that uh, he's really excited by Xabi Alonso's uh, Leverkusen as well. And Rasko Masaki is patiently waiting for Beck to come back in. He got some minutes for the international youth sides this break as well. Oh, I did. I missed that. That's great. Love to hear that. Um, what I saw of him last season, he played a couple of games, didn't he? And um, before he got injured again. But in those couple of games he played, you know, he got like a big like ovation from the crowd at the end of the game. He's off chat clapping to the fans. He seems well loved by the Saul fans. Uh, he wears the number one shirt, even though he isn't the number one. So I, I get I get the vibe that like he's well liked by the fans and they're maybe like they're rooting for him there. So if he's getting minutes at international, um, that's great. I think, uh, you know, definitely, you know, if it's not this season, you know, we might still get a season's worth because I think he's got 21, 22 now. So he's still got a couple of years of utility. He's got a chance of uh, becoming a useful U23. And as we were saying last week on the podcast, I'm sat on a few like that, that are like almost there. I did list my Nick Shinton just to see if I could get a quick flip and I got some offers on it. I think I had it listed at like, 0.19 which is almost like double what I paid for him but I started getting offers at like 1.17 and then when I started seeing those offers come in I started thinking to myself that's still cheap to give away like a backup U23 keeper at, like at Club Bruges you know what I mean I think yeah a goalkeeper like that could just be sent out on loan next season could be could be a, could be a starter somewhere so I just decided to delist it I thought to myself I'd Take a quick flip now. Like we were saying, it still doesn't feel like the seller's time just yet, does it, Quinny? It's uh, difficult to let go of cards at the prices at the current sort of market situation. Which brings me on to uh, a question for you, which I, I see in the chat earlier. Uh, what What are your current sort of thoughts on the market? Do you see Do you see an up, an upwards spike coming anytime soon, or do you think that this is kind of like the level for cards at the moment? You know the time. I'm is, up, you know, yeah, I, I'm always quite um, trepidatious around saying things will go up and down and all the rest of it because, like, it really is like we spoke about before, like SRD values. The, it is like the decisions of two people affect the price of everyone's card. You know, basically. So, um, I never, but I think like the. So I think it, this kind of ties into some of our stuff we spoke about, right? But I think what the 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 unique Mbappe sale. The increase in the threshold for, hold on, 
I'm getting a call. This is a spam call. I can tell it is, right? But I've never had a spam call from Croatia before. Right? So I'm going to take <laughs> this, right? Two seconds. Let's have a listen. Hello? It's, uh, it's Pavel Can you hear it? Can you hear it? I can't now. Oh, but then. Can you hear that? A computer talking to you. Yeah, it's all computer telling me that my Amazon Prime account's gone and I need to give it my crowd details oh. um, or something to get at. I don't know. That's Spam it. call. Sorry, guys. That's but um, it, the Mbappe unique, the, the increase in thresholds that we've seen is super and unique. And then even everything that we've already spoke about in the podcast that we see now in the rare and unlimited level, these are, for me, four very clear and almost completely segregated sections of the market in terms of how they're running in terms of like fiat or ETH, where the prices are at, where the sentiments are, at, where the utilities are. At. All three or all four of those, for the most part, I think they're all kind of relatively siloed. So like, even though I'm a bit more excited now to get that extra super rare that I've been needing anyway, or that extra super rare goalkeeper that I should say, um, the market for them has went up. But again, like, has the market for limited goalkeepers changed? Not a job, you know, so encompassing the whole market now is even even harder than before and maybe even less um appropriate because like if you're at the limited level and you're buying cards for a tenner and they go to a fiver then there's different things at play than the super rare threshold or the price of a unique mbappe or even the price of rare cards if you get me so like i think you need to really know the space of so rare you're running in and you know the factors that affect that part of it because if you're yeah. in it j and k there's so many factors going on in there now where you get new season cards. If you don't, you don't get rewards, but yeah. then you've got powered up cards for a year. And there's a new, oh, that's another thing that came out in that John podcast. They're changing the double game week rule and it's going to be NBA. Oh, Baseball. nice. That's, that's massive. I can't believe I brought that up earlier, but yeah. <laughs> They're best balling. I like that because I think the current rule is that like if they have two games in a week, if they're even on the bench and don't come on, the, no, no, they changed that back a while ago. They had to feature. First time they feature, they're in. But now it's best ball. Or will be best ball. They've not, I, I, don't, I don't think it's officially like best, announced. But The best score of the two will be the score that they keep. So that actually means that if you've got a double game week ahead, you've got like a really good shout, really. Like those cards will actually be double. Banging. Because it'll be like, you know, if they have a shit first game, you've still got another chance for them to bang later in the week. That... I mean, there the, the probably are a few um, sort of Korean uh, community users in the chat now. If you're in the chat, I know we've got quite a few usually. Uh, let us know what you think of that. Um, if this is the first time you've heard about it, how do you feel about your double game week players getting the opportunity to put up a bigger score rather than just taking the first one that, that, that they feature in? I, I, as someone who has quite a few Korean cards, I like that. And I know that... Um, Olsan and a lot of the teams that play in the AFC Champions League, like the Asian uh, Champions League, will have those double game weeks because of the time of the split and stuff. Um, that's going to be good. Uh, Rascal Misaki says, uh, not great for K-League. It probably won't get AA for the second game, but it's an improvement. Uh, Is there a reason? Oh, I see. Yeah, because of the, the, time. the turnaround. Yeah. That is an interesting point. That is a very interesting point. I mean, it might be the case for some games where they have that, maybe like the Friday afternoon. Uh, do we get any Friday afternoon kickoffs, actually? No, I don't think we do, do we? They're normally like in the morning. Yeah, good point. I think it will it will come into play in that case. Yeah, it might not actually make the, the, the difference, will it? Unless they... Yeah, unless they can get those AA scores in a bit quicker. Hope, hopefully the situation there changes. It, it, I've, it's been a little bit more... Um, we've had a le less problems, I've found, in the last couple of weeks with those scores coming in, usually within about 24 hours, sometimes quicker. Um, but that first couple of weeks, it was a bit hairy, wasn't it? Anyone that plays with Korean cards, you just weren't really sure if uh, we were going to get them. I've actually put my all my Korean cards into my All-Star Pro for the week weekend they've got some good fixtures um my 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 asia uh teams are mostly made up of all san daegu and seoul so i've managed i managed to put um my all-star pro team this week is uh all san defensive stack uh 
of Joe Hyun Woo in goal, goal and uh, Seo Young Woo Super Rare in defence. Midfield, I've got Osmar Super Rare. And then my sort of like attacking options is uh, Daegu, uh, Sassinia Captain Rare. And um, who else is that? Uh, the young, the young lad who plays right wing. I can't remember his name. I can see his face. Uh, but yeah, that's, I put them all in. I put them all in my All Star Pro uh, this week. Um, and that, I think I mentioned last week. I've started like mixing them back into the other stuff, um, as opposed to just keeping them in one team. I'm a little bit less worried about the sort of Korean situation, but it just so happens that those kind of fixtures come together quite nicely. And I, I think. All Star Pro is quite a good one to target. I don't know about you, Quinny. You've always been a big All Star player, haven't you? But yeah, All Star Pro, but now for me is really so. I'm I'm really feeling this shift of the colours in my gallery, where I'm not really doing D threes that much anymore. I'm going mm. quite hard against red and blue now. You know, just yeah. going after them um, because I think I've seen it last week. But like, I just want to I want to make global lineups. Like that's the way my gallery's built is. Part of the problem I've had with D3s over the last, until the recent cap modes came out and whatever is that like I've always been missing like oh I need a midfielder for challenger and it's like I don't yeah. want to go and I don't like any of the challenger midfielders I just want to use a midfielder I already have but you only get one you, know, you get glo- two global teams depending on how you used to think of it for rares um, or now how you think of it so the cap modes uh, I now get extra all star opportunities is kind of how I think about it in terms of the, the the combinations of teams I can build so I need to make less. Um, you know, what's the word? Uh, compromises, you know, to make a team fit. I can just put them in caps and stuff. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of leaning that way, going red and blue for the most part. Yeah, I like that. I, I can, I think since I started by, since the, the main thing that changed it for me was the need for a goalkeeper in D2. Because then it was like, you know, you need, then once, once you're using like a super rare goalkeeper, you feel like you have to go, Go hard or go home in the super air divisions, I find. And um, it, yeah, it's definitely made me look, especially like I'm looking now at sort of like my challenger Europe. Um, my best entry is always in D4 in, in the in the regions now. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good point you make. And I think uh, I'm similar. I'm in a similar position. I'm just having a look at sort of what I've got like penciled in for the weekend and I think U23 is the only uh, region where I still go quite heavy into pro. But I think that's just because I've got quite a lot of good uh, super rare U23s. Whereas in the other regions, my super rare options are not like the best ones that you need for those regions. So going heavier into all-star with like better better players in the positions that they need to play in really. But um, yeah, I've been, I definitely feel like I've been targeting all-star rare and rare pro more than i have some of the other divisions of late and i'm just looking now i just got my i got my teams up um so the other player in my all-star rare pro is go jay hyun the uh the u23 plays as a right winger for daegu cool. i couldn't remember his name for the life of me but he's been i picked a couple of him up because I, I think he's a good player i've got got two of his rare cards um but yeah excited for the weekend uh apart from yeah i'm looking now at like my d2s and all of my goalkeepers are like risky. U23 goalkeeper Tani, Maximenko f- for uh, Spartak's a usual substitute keeper. But you know, there's talk that um, Selikov was was ill, and they think he'd be fit back. But you know, there is an an outside chance he might play. So I've got a couple of like really punty teams in D2 that like you know need a player to come back from injury or need a goalkeeper to be rested or something like that. Um, I've got a kick-off unique entry with that new unique in there. Nice. Uh, Kay and Sound says, do we think Florentine will start this weekend? Um, I've put him in a punty team. I I think if I've he... seen him in training that he played a friendly match. Is that the Orenberg guy? Yes. Has he been training? Yeah. He played a friendly or something. I've got him in... Um, yeah, I've got him in my... U23 super rare team, but it's full of punts. I think he plays. I think he plays. I think I think if he's remotely fit, he plays. He's like their best player by miles, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, my U23 super rare team's got him in it. It's also got Tani and Go, and it has Vigan at the back, who, uh, yeah, it's 
it is the most ragtag U23 Super Rare team I think I've ever put in. But if they all start, you know, we're, we're in the lot in the in the running with the lottery ticket, so to speak. Um, I'm looking now at the the sort of a uh, lineup predictions and stuff like that, and um, I've I, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but Matt Vay Safanov, as far as the Sora Data community is concerned, only a thirty percent chance of starting. Um, wow, he was he was he had COVID last week, and mm. you know from from the sort of Russian football that I've, I follow, they seem to think he'll start. They seem to think he's back, but yeah. Um, Kayan sounds also... So Kayan, you obviously uh, share a few players with me. You're also sort of keeping an eye out for any news on Foremost Mendy. Uh, he was away with Senegal. I think it was Chani was in the chat earlier, said that um, Senegal did actually bring him off the bench for one game. So I think the only factor there is more that did he get back from international break with enough time to prepare for the game? He is an important player for Amiens if he's there. Um, what day is their fixture is probably the big question. I haven't put him in any of my lineups just yet, but Good point. If, they, if they play on Sunday, I think maybe he will play. If they play on Saturday morning, he might be less likely, but I might have a little look at that and see when he's playing and, and use that as like my, my indicator. Kayan says Sunday. It is usually Sunday for France, isn't it? So um, he might be of he might be of use. Might be of use. Joey Veerman's the big uh what's going on with him this weekend he apparently hasn't trained with psv all week but he is in the traveling squad so people are expecting him to start but you know he still has a question mark over his head whether or not he'll start but um but yeah we're getting all the questions coming in now about uh, all the players injured i think it's that time of the week isn't it for anyone anyone that plays so rare we've got what three and a bit hours to get those teams locked in one hour and ten minutes until the deadline live stream Yes, on Quinny's uh, YouTube channel. Make sure you're locked in. Uh, but yeah, I'm. am just looking now. How are you feeling about the weekend, Quinny? You got what are your high hopes for this weekend for your fixture wise? Mate, I think I've got a team that's going to win All Star Rare. Wow, big. You want to hear this? Let's have it. Right. So all of these guys are level twenty, except for one of them at level nineteen and one's at level eighteen. Right. So you ready? I'm ready. Rare. All black and goals at home to Betis. Guardiol at home to Mines. Wurtz away to Schalke. Jota away to Ross County. And Ferran Torres away to Elche. He's at 90% on the start. Yeah, I've seen that as well. I've got him in I've got him in my cap to 40. I think they all get 80 this week. I think I'm gonna rock out with before multiplier, like what's five eights again? <laughs> 400, 400 plus multiply, yeah. 400, there we go. I was going to say 400, and I thought, no, that's not right. It's like for something else. But yeah, like that. so I'm hopeful for it. And I think I'll be, I'll be riding high. 80 pluses all across the board uh, for those guys. I've got some other hopes in the bigger divisions and whatever, but that's the one that when I built it, I thought, oh, yeah, like that should be a, uh, yeah, all of them should kill when individually, you, in the, you know. In the lineup builder, have they all got those AAA fixtures? Because that always gets uh -huh. me really excited. Yeah, yeah they're I'm all rated. Good looking at my teams as well and i think like i've got verts as well i so i think my strongest team uh on paper this weekend is my u23 rare uh they should all start and i've gone for van der Voort in goal who's at home to uh, uh leuven so he's got a 63 percent chance of win uh i think of a 30 or 40 percent chance of a clean sheet there uh Gvardiol, who's at home to mines like yours uh, Florian Verts, captain, away to Schalke, like yours. Uh, Anas Zorori at home to Sunderland. And then Strahinja Pavlovic away to uh, Klagenfurt. I think that's my strongest team. They've got those nice big dark green AAA fixtures. Um, apart from Zorori, he's got a kind of light green A. But I'll take that. Um, and I think that my rare pro is looking good if Veerman, if I can take the risk on Veerman or not. I, I, that's a difficult difficult bit but i could move him and out if i i think between now and where's Rick, frimpong going this week where are you putting him i've got him in my u23 rare pro which is murich in goal frimpong veerman super res sesco and killian kaibue captain kaibue is one of the top scoring so5 cards at the moment 
Um, he played, I won him as a rare and sold him for nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right before the right at the World Cup, I won him and sold him. Like that's it. Oh, yeah, he he's been really useful. Um, he's got a good home fixture um, against uh, is it Paris FC? I think. Uh, See, one thing oh, I did want to put out in this podcast session, there's not really been a natural point to do it, so I'm just going to squeeze it out now, right? For anyone who does come to the podcast after a bit of end product, right? Old favourite on my channel, right? Felix Nemeka, brother of Lucas, made his senior German debut in this international break, by oh, the way. Nice. So he's now a fully senior-capped German international, and he's had a good season, he's just come back from an injury. But if he's getting capped for Germany, like... You know, if you need people to give you confirmation bias on you think you've spotted a good player, getting cap tied so he cannot play for England, he'll play for Germany. If Germany are going to go to that extent with him, great. Um, they must rate him. You know, Musiala vibes, you know, maybe not talent wise, you know, but um, national team wise in that sense, you know. So he's, his rares are 60 quid, his limiteds are five quid. Under 23 midfielder until next season. Bombastic box to box and mm. scores goals and all that fun stuff. So just a wee one I thought I'd throw out there. Good player. I tell you what, I'm I'm just looking now. Another another lineup that I'm I'm quite quietly excited about is actually my Champ Euro rare as it stands, because I've Ooh. managed to fit a lot of those players who have the nice like ten percent bonuses that we mentioned last yep. week. So I've got Yehan Diouf in goal. Uh, he's got a nice ten percent bonus. Kalidou Koulibaly, nice ten percent. Captain Tony Cruz, so you get a Wait. full thirty percent out of him. Uh, Jocelyn, off the back of uh, you know scoring his goals for Spain in the international break, um, and Giovanni Di Lorenzo of another ten percent. So I've got like, I think uh, Jocelyn is like nine and a half percent bonus, but the rest of them have got the have got the uh, the ten percent. Um, and Tony Cruz with an eighty percent win chance on the weekend, captain. I'd expect some you know some some good end product from him after the. International break, he tends to start because he doesn't doesn't play for Germany. So uh, I'm I'm quite excited about that. You know, the opportunity to win another uh, Man United uh, rare would not will not go amiss. I'd love to be in amongst the options there. So uh, I I definitely have some lineups that look on paper good this weekend. I am just a little bit concerned. Oh, oh also I got so this will be the first weekend that I put in the. The dream team into the challenger. And I was talking last week. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So Rulli and Timber for Ajax at the back. Veerman and Javi Simons in midfield and Tadic up front. Uh, so again, yes. kind of we're relying on the Veerman news a little bit on that one. Uh, but I, if I if I want, I could swap Veerman out for uh, Berghaus. I've got a Berghaus limited that I could probably swap in there if Veerman looks unlikely. Um, another thing I did this week. Um, which I haven't spoken about is I decide I, I've, I've been seeing all this, you know, road to glory content, which I really hey. find interesting yourself and Tony got involved in it. I've seen a lot of people doing it and I thought I will put together a $50 um, America uh, squad and I'm going to use them in one of the regions. Like I'll only select from that pool of players and put them in, one of the regions or caps or whatever and try and track like the sort of ROI. So what I've done is I've set up like a watch list on so red data of the players that I bought in. Some of them I already had in. So I just factored in what is their current market price if I bought them today. So I, I got sure. like 12 players with a budget of 50 pounds. Um, and I'm putting that team into cap 240 limited this weekend. Um, Talavera in goal, uh, Matias de los Santos, Leonardo Suarez, Julio Furch and Carlos Beltran going into cap 240. So, yeah, I'm going to start sort of like just tracking the progress of that 12 players being used in a region or cap mode. Um, and the sort of that rough plan I've got there, like my tactic for the uh, road to glory, if you like, with that 12 players is that as it stands, I've just got the one goalkeeper. I'm hoping that I can win enough in the next few weeks to pick up the second goalkeeper, which would an option open up. Um, an option to maybe put into two teams. I did look at the potential to put them into cap 220 um, with what was left over, but they, the players left over don't fit into it, even with like any of my, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, common. Of course, yeah. So yeah, it's so. just, just I'm getting just the one entry out of that 12 players. Um, but I, I love a challenge. I think, 
the road to glory but with a budget of 50 quid you know if you can win 10 thresholds you've you've, you've got your money back haven't you so pretty much uh, that's how chani's scaling it which I, I like the way he's doing that in terms of the mental gymnastics on um appropriating cards for the squad like how much uh, you know do, will it take for this squad the strategy to pay back on and that's kind of something similar to what i was talking about earlier but chani's actually a living proof example of it but like when you are forecasting your team you know in terms of what you can go out and achieve you know like it's a bit you know you've got more metrics there to stack against you know um mm. so mm. i might not love to hear i look forward to seeing it as well mate sounds class i just think that it was the perfect time to do it it like it feels like for me that the market ha is Maybe not bottomed out, but this is like for anyone that wanted to get in. And it was more like I'm in a group chat with a few of my mates that play very low stakes. And, you know, most weekends they forget to put their teams in. They're that kind of like level of so rare player. And I thought, sure. let me just show my what I, I hope I'm going to show my friends <laughs> what he can do with 50 quid. Basically, is like that's the point is like the content hopefully will be like useful. Um, again, it's difficult to do stuff like this in sort of like short format, but I always try and try and do my content more for like tiktok and insta and stuff but i think 50 quid uh just to show like you know following a bunch of players that no one's heard of a lot of these players are at clubs or have left clubs so they they shouldn't their supply should be stopped as well which i think Thanks. is another like added bonus in terms of like roi if you pick up a player who starts to score well when they move clubs and that club is not a, a place where you get cards minted you could end up with a player who, you know, becomes quite sought after as well. So that's another like little um, box ticked for me. I think like Talavera's at Juarez and Matias de los Santos is at Colo Colo. And uh, yeah, they're all at clubs that like they've moved. A lot of them have moved clubs. And I'm just, yeah, the, the good thing about using that watch list on So Red Data is it also will track the price of all those cards as well. So I can show the value of that 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 team like over time as well as... And then I can add players in that I win. So it's going to be easy to track the ROI that way in terms of like the cards and the trades that I make. So fingers crossed for it. Looking forward to seeing if we get any wins out of the cap modes out of the America uh, mode. Maybe all, maybe sometimes it will go into all star, but, uh, but yeah, bit of, bit of limited. I've got some hope for my limiteds this week. You know, I've, we always talk about my legends limited. Yes. Still, still waiting for a win out of them. And they're, they're going in again this week. Uh, I've decided as it stands to go in with the Zidane instead of the, the Loudrop. Uh, Zidane. Uh, you a big game for Bayern. New manager, Thomas Tuchel yeah. coming in. I think it's just the, the thing that puts me off is just like that. I think we spoke about it before. The problem with that Loudrop card is that they only play two players, maybe one who is a midfield option for them in terms of SO5 cards. Whereas Juve play about five midfielders. Or players who have midfield cards, yeah. and Wolf they have a home against Verona this weekend, which is much more winnable, I think. Well, it should be anyway. But Matt, I've got Matthew Ryan at home to Heron Veen in goal, and uh, Paulo Diaz River Plate, um, and yeah, they've got an easy fixture as well. So maybe fingers crossed, a bit of end product finally for the legends. <laughs> the legends need. Uh, to become legendary. They haven't been particularly legendary for Club Tropicana, unfortunately. So hoping for some end product there. But um lots of options oh this weekend. A lot of a lot of interesting teams. A few punty ones, hoping for some so coins out of those. But but yeah, how many teams you got out this weekend? I've got you? like uh like eight, nine competitive teams. I've just actually worked out how to get Tony into a team. Um yeah, because I was just looking at who I had left, and I had Tony and a few other people, and I'm like, no, I need to get these ones into a team somehow this week. Um, so I caught Tony's road to glory, and Tony was tempted to play himself, so it must be <laughs> that's got to be a good shout, yeah. Yeah, it must be. It must feel he's getting a goal this weekend, no matter how you know. So um, if he's tempted to play himself, that's always a good sign. So I managed to squeeze Tony into a into a fun team as well. So I have got like eight or nine teams that are, I'm pretty excited about. The big one I've told you about, and I was really conflicted. It's probably one of the last things I can get to. Stash now, I need to get um, wrapped up and stuff. But um, this week I was really conflicted with taking All Star Super Rare out of the equation and putting my stronger Celtics cards, my Celtic cards, into two seventy Super. And then taking that unique and putting it into kickoff and trying to have two bully teams mm. rather than like trying to muscle my way into All Star this week, and I've destroyed my teams and rebuilt them so many times, and I've tried to work it out. And I don't know. I think I would ultimately regret more not playing my team in All Star Super Rare because it is 
a decent enough fixture. I've got good enough cards. Like, and uh, yeah, it's one of those ones. You know, when you change the plan, that's the weekend that comes in, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'm resisting fate enough that I'm going to be in for a good weekend. Hopefully. Good luck, mate. Good luck. I think, yeah, my I'm not feeling too confident about any of my uh, D2 entries, which is a shame because I've got some great cards there, but the goalkeepers are just letting me down massively. It's hard to admit that like, mate, I made so many mistakes in the market in the last few months in terms of my goalkeeper buying. I should have just like, instead of buying five, like maybe... Oh, I've been there, man. Bought one, one definite, just spent all the money on a one or two that like play every week, guaranteed. Uh, but yeah, that's you know, I it is what it is, and I am where I am because of it. I've got to figure out a way to uh, use them. So yeah, I think D three for me is uh, is going to be the way at the moment until some of my goalkeepers get get a little bit more game time. But um, yeah, twenty, you got you got to get off. You got another stream, haven't you? In a in just under an hour, you got to go get yourself a spot of lunch. Uh, you go get a wee bit of food in my tummy. You get some fresh air about me and. Um... And waking up a little bit because we always get comfy stish and we always just get into and that's the thing i really like about especially since we've been doing this on twitch is um you know it, it just feels like we're on a call kind of thing just catching yeah. up and what you up to this weekend and, da, 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 and that's part of the and it's all about in product it's all about actually building the teams that go out and win the stuff and the market chat and whatever so by the time we finish this in the friday morning this kind of twitch vibe we've got going on i'm always dead comfy and always a bit like uh but i need to get back on my toes and get the tunes on um, yeah. for, <laughs> for one o'clock. And I, I said this before we come on, but by the way, anyone who hasn't caught it, make sure you do follow Stish everywhere across social media because he's got some fucking banging content going out there now of Stishy uh, causing raves and all sorts of yeah. <laughs> uh, fun DJ stuff, you know, loving his best off, life. Off to Huddersfield tonight. So uh, if anyone's uh, from that neck of the woods, I'll be playing. Uh, it's actually the last ever show at this venue, which is incredible in Huddersfield. Oh, that's uh, cool. Called Basement. It's a uh, very small venue. Uh, I think it's sold, they sold it out before they even announced the lineup. To be honest, so I know it's going to be a big one there. Uh, so I'll be one of the last people to ever play at this venue. It's got the most insane sound system inside it. Like one of those ones where you go in, it goes like straight through your body, like the bass. Wow. So uh, yeah, pretty good one ahead for me tonight. A long journey up to Huddersfield, about four trains to get there. But um, wow, yeah, I think I've got a couple of hours to do my teams, and then I'll be pretty much like heading out just as the deadline closes. So uh, yeah, I might pop my head into the stream. Might see me pop up in the chat there. Uh, Love it. But yeah, gang, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Quinny, as always, great chat. Good talking to you. And uh, Pleasure was mine, mate. Good luck this game week. And good luck, Tony. Go get the goals, buddy. Yes, mate. Good luck, Tony. Uh, thanks, everyone. Good luck the weekend. And we'll be back again uh, next week. Cheers, all.